Hi guys, welcome to your lesson on ocean zones. So oceanographers are scientists who study the ocean and they have divided the zone up or the ocean up into zones according to how far down the sunlight reaches. So zones, another word for zones is sections. So the ocean is divided up into different sections based on how much sunlight each section gets. So the part of the ocean that sunlight reaches is called the photic zone. And the parts that it doesn't reach is called the aphotic zone. So remember whenever you have the letter A in front of a word, it usually means not. So um, aphotic means not photic or no light. The part of the shore that is affected by tides is called the intertidal zone. So in this zone, that's where the waves are crashing on the beach. And in this zone, you have sea life that has to adjust to varying amounts of water and has to be very adaptable. So during high tide, the sea life that lives in this zone has to be able to handle more water. And during low tide, they have to be able to handle less water. Here's a diagram that kind of breaks down the different zones. And so far, we've gone over the photic and the aphotic and the inner tidal. So that's all I want you to focus on right now is at the right hand side, look at the light blue. The skinny top part is the photic zone. And then the darker blue, you see the aphotic zone goes from the bottom of the photic all the way down to the bottom of the ocean to the abyssal zone. So obviously you can see that the aphotic zone is much, much larger because the ocean's really deep. Sunlight does not reach that far down into the ocean. And then you can see the intertidal zone. That's right on the shore in the sand where the waves crash, where the tide comes up and goes back during low tide. These are just some organisms, um, just a large variety of organisms that live in the intertidal zone. Um, so there's the low tide zone, the middle tide zone, the high tide zone, and the spray zone, which is usually the pretty, pretty dry area. Um, high tide zone is the part that's really, really wet during high tide. And middle zone is both wet and dry depending on what tide it is. So as you can see, there's a really wide variety of different organisms that live in this intertidal zone. And each of them play a very special role in the ecosystem. Here's another diagram for you, um, showing you both the photic and the aphotic zone. So you can see what kinds of organisms live in the photic zone. You have sharks, jellyfish, turtles, different kinds of plankton, coral, different kinds of plants. And then you see um, the intertidal zone. You can see where it would be at high tide and where it would be at low tide. So at low tide, that little section in the top left that's covered with water, that says high water, that little section would not have water at low tide. Um, and then look at the aphotic zone. Look at the different kinds of organisms that live there that don't, that live where there is not sunlight. Sea cucumbers, those of you who have seen Finding Nemo. Sea cucumbers, the anglerfish, that's the fish that, that the light comes on. You see that little guy at the bottom right of the screen? Um, lots of stuff from Finding Nemo in here. Okay, so moving on with the zones. We've done the aphotic zone, the photic zone, and we've done the intertidal zone. So we're moving into more zones, the neuritic zone. The neuritic zone is the very top of the photic zone. Lots and lots of life here because there's lots and lots of, sea of sunlight. Most of the ocean's autotrophs are here. We haven't gotten into ecosystems yet, but when we do, we're gonna learn about different kinds of um, organisms and how they get their food. And autotrophs are organisms that make their own food, and they make their own food from sunlight. So those are grasses, seaweed, photosynthetic bacteria, so bacteria that photosynthesize, and algae. Lots and lots of, of life in the neuritic zone because of the sunlight. The pelagic zone is the middle zone. That's the zone not near the coast or the seafloor, and it's called the open ocean zone. It's divided into five vertical layers, and as you go down, as you get deeper into the ocean, there's less life. 
And then last is a benthic zone. That's the floor of the ocean. There's no light deeper down, and organisms here are scavengers, and they survive on dead or decaying matter. It's very, very cold down here, and there's very little oxygen in this layer, which is why there are um, organisms that have to survive on things that are dead. All right, so here is another diagram for you. This is showing you the pelagic zone and then the five layers of the pelagic zone. You don't need to memorize those layers, but just understand that as you go down in the ocean, there's less life. You can see all the life in the top of the pelagic, the epipelagic. Then you go to the mesopelagic and there's less life. And the bathypelagic, that's where you have the octopus and the whale. And then the abyssopelagic and the hadopelagic at the very bottom. Another picture off to the right of the intertidal zone showing you all the different organisms again that live and have to adapt in that zone. Um, here's that same diagram we looked at in the beginning, only this time we're going to look again. Um, we're going to look at the neuritic zone, we're going to look at the pelagic, and we're going to look at the benthic. So the neuritic is in the very top. Neuritic is where we had the most life. And again, that's because it has sunlight. That's where all the, the organisms that depend on photosynthesis live. The pelagic is in the middle. And the benthic zone is the ocean floor. So deep ocean. Deep ocean is really cool. Because so much is happening down there, but it's hard to study because it's so far down. So traditionally, scientists have used ships to photograph the depths of the ocean, to drop floats and drifters into the currents, and then to collect samples of water, rock, and marine life. However, in recent years, the amount of tools for looking at the deep ocean has really grown, and that includes human-occupied submersibles, so things that go underwater that carry humans with them, uh, remote controlled vehicles and uh, autonomous robots. So robots that can go down to the bottom of the ocean. At one time, scientists thought that life couldn't exist on the deep ocean floor. And in 1977, scientists diving in a ship called the Alvin to the Galapagos Rift, they discovered a new community of organisms. Not until 1977, so we think we've known so much about science for so long, but 1977 is not really that long ago. That's just a little bit longer than I've been alive. So these organisms can withstand tremendous pressure. Deep down at the bottom of the ocean, there's so much water, so there's high pressure. Um, they can withstand varied temperatures, both high and low temperatures, complete darkness, and toxic chemicals. So these organisms that, that were found at the bottom of the ocean are called extremophiles. And they're called extremophiles because they live in extreme living conditions. The discovery of life at these vents and seeps revolutionize what scientists understand about how and where life can exist on Earth. So the organisms that thrive at deep sea vents and seeps have to survive freezing cold temperatures, total darkness, high, high pressure, and very, very toxic chemicals. So the two very different types of extreme living conditions that are found in the bottom of the ocean are hydrothermal vents and cold seeps. And as you can see from the word hydrothermal, you have the word prefix hydro, which means water, and thermal, which means heat. So you have hot water, and then you also have something that's really, really cold. So organisms either live in the really, really hot or the really, really, really cold. So hydrothermal vents and cold seeps are places where chemical-rich fluids leak out from the seafloor, often providing the energy to sustain lush communities of life in very harsh living environments. So the, the fluids that are leaking from the seafloor bring really, really large amounts of chemicals, and those chemicals are actually what keep those organisms alive. So studying the organisms at hydrothermal vents and cold seeps really expands our understanding of how life first took hold and slowly evolved on our planet as well as where it might exist elsewhere in the solar system and beyond. So these organisms that live down in these harsh environments are the same kinds of organisms that 
came to be when, when life first started on Earth. And so by studying these, scientists can really, really understand, or at least try to understand, how life has evolved on our planet over time. So hydrothermal vents are located on the crest or the top of oceanic ridges and are driven by heat from volcanism beneath the ocean floor. So that's where that heat comes from is volcanoes under the ocean floor. And they release dissolved minerals into the ocean. Vents and the ecosystems they support are created and destroyed as the volcanoes get worse and, and less over time. So when you have lots of volcanism underneath the ocean floor, those vents and those ecosystems might be destroyed. When you have very quiet volcanic activity, then the vents and the ecosystems can live. All right, so finishing up, cold seeps. They're just a little bit different. They produce a slow flow of low temperature fluids, and they're often made of natural gas and a mix of what are called hydrocarbons. The methane, which is a form of gas seeping from the seafloor, that is actually what sustains microbes. And microbes, um, we're going to get into microbes and diseases in our next unit, but they're a very, very, very tiny form of life. And microbes serve as the base of the food chain for communities of animals that live down in this zone where there's no sun and it's really cold. So far more natural gas is sequestered from the, on the seafloor or leaking from it than can be drilled from all of the existing wells on Earth. Some seeps in the ocean may be thousands of years old. So we have these cold seeps where we have natural gas leaking. Okay, so natural gas, gas isn't always hot. Get, in this case, natural gas leaking out is very cold, and these different microbes, these tiny, tiny, tiny forms of life, are able to survive and become the base of the food chain for many communities of animals that, that live off of those microbes. All right, finishing up. So animals such as clams, mussels, snails, shrimp, they feed on those microbes, and in turn, they provide food for fish and other predators. And some vent and seep animals, such as tube worms and shrimp, also host, so they also let microbes who live because they, chemo, they are chemosynthetic animals. So we have photosynthetic, which are animals or um, organisms that depend on light and the sun, from the sun, and chemosynthetic, which are animals that depend on chemicals. And these are chemicals from the ocean. So some of these animals host chemosynthetic microbes on or within their bodies, providing a place for the microbes to live. In exchange, the microbes give them nutrients. And again, we haven't gotten into ecosystems yet, but we're going to get into the types of symbiotic relationships. And we'll be getting into food chains and food webs. And when we do, we're going to revisit marine food webs so that we can come back and, um, and this will make sense in a different kind of, in a different branch of science. Okay, don't forget to request lessons or ask questions about anything from the lesson that you might not have, uh, that might not be clear, that might need just a little bit of clearing up. Um, don't forget to, to look up words that you might not understand the meaning of. And I hope you enjoyed your lesson on ocean zones. Have a great day.